I have to say, I just think this is magnificent. I love that Alberta has this kind of initiative going to attract uh, healthcare professionals to rural communities. I love rural medicine. I am passionate about rural medicine. And I think the biggest tragedy in healthcare in Canada would be the death of the rural physician. So um, first and foremost, kudos to all of you STPs who are here still making your communities viable every single day in medicine. Um, so here's the details. Uh, as, you, as you heard, I did medical school at the university in a U UBC program uh, called the Northern Medical Program. Uh, and that program is a part of the distribution. So in the space of about four years, University of British Columbia expanded from 168 medical students each year. My year was 224. The year after me was 248. And I think we're on the edges of 284 at this stage. Um, and they've distributed their program so that it's not just in Vancouver. We've made tremendous use of technology out of the University of British Columbia, where most of my lectures in medical school actually came in via video conference. So, you know, I think that some of this, uh, and I'm gonna speak to some technology again a little bit later in my presentation, it was an exciting program to be in and I was glad to be there. Um, they've also worked on distribution of family, family practice residency programs. So, and uh, the rural Alberta North and rural Alberta South has done this. And I think that's amazing work and it needs to continue because it is the truth that people will practice where they are trained. If you are not trained in rural Alberta, I mean, it's not to say that nobody's going to come and work in rural Alberta if they're not practiced there, if they're not trained there, but the more people who are trained in these areas, the more people that are going to be excited about working in them. Um, so yeah, I practiced in, in Fort St. John, and then I had my baby, and we went to high level, and it was a fantastic move. I love it there, and a lot of people who I told that I was going to high level went, you're going where now? What now? <laughs> So you can see, uh, I'm actually from, I was born and raised in Fort Nelson and the uh, Chetwind area. Um, and then I was in Fort St. John, which you can see just, uh, just across from BC. Incidentally, that part of BC, by the way, doesn't really consider ourselves to be British Columbians. Okay, so we don't. We think we're Albertans. Um, if you, we do. If you, if you follow the map, if you look at the way the map looks, you can see that part of the, the lower part of Alberta, the Alberta map and BC map follows the Rocky Mountains. My theory is that at some point somebody ran out of money to map this out and so they drew a straight line up. And if they'd followed the Rocky Mountains, I would have been an Albertan all along. <laughs> okay. <laughs> You can see high level is just across the border from where I was born and raised. So, you know, a lot of people said to me, oh my God, do you know that there's snow up there? Yes, I do. <laughs> oh my God, do you, do you know that that's really far north? Yes, I do. I knew exactly what I was getting into and I was really excited to be going there. Minus 40 in sunshine every single day, folks. Yeah. I don't mind. <laughs> You can see it's a fair distance from Edmonton. So Edmonton is about a seven and a half hour trip. We are in fact the middle point from between Edmonton and uh, Yellowknife. So if you're gonna drive to Yellowknife, it's uh, I think something on the order of 750 kilometers to high level and 755 to carry on to, um, to, carry on to Yellowknife. And this was the other question I got a lot. You're going where now? Why are you doing that? Okay. And here's why. In a word, Heine Brusso brought me to high level. So he's one of our major physicians up there. He is an amazing person. Um, I had the opportunity to work with him when I was a resident in Fort St. John. He was there. And uh, in my second year of residency, he relocated to high level and had tried to recruit me pretty well since. Um, he said to me, listen, you, you have to understand, this is the medicine that you love, Jen. This is the medicine that you love. This is First Nations and obstetrics. 500 plus deliveries a year in high level. 
eight major reservations around the high level and surrounding area. This is the medicine that you love, Jen, you should come. I wasn't really ready to let go of Fort St. John, so I stuck around there for a couple of years, and when I was ready, I phoned up Heine and went, buddy, I need a change. How about if I come to you now? And he said, oh, thank heavens. Yay, we're glad to have you. <laughs> well, it wasn't exactly like that, but you know. <laughs> um, so amongst the, the key points, though, here is that there was a physician in high level who I trusted and I knew, okay? And I think this is really important um, when you're looking at trying to bring people in, having that physician connection is really important. Um, the physicians in your community need to be engaged. And listen, I'm, I'm going to tell you guys a lot of stuff that you already know. And from the things that I've heard today, this is something you already know. You know that the physician engagement needs to be there. Um, so, you know, there it is, plain and simple. I went to high level because Heine's there and because he said that I would like it there and it turns out he was right. Um, yeah, so why else? It's a really welcoming medical community. So I went up there just, just for a look, just to see. And Heine and his lovely wife, Debbie, put on a supper and had all the rest of the physicians there. The doctor on call in the emergency department came and dropped in for a few minutes for supper. I had a tour of the hospital and everybody in the hospital was excited to see me and excited to meet me, um, happy at the prospect of having another physician. And, and it just looked like a happy, well-run facility that I could easily get along in. There's good real estate up there. I like real estate. So, you know, there's lots of land and it's not particularly expensive. So that's an attraction factor for me. May not be for other people, but it is for me. It's really interesting medicine. We do interesting things in high level. So um, when I started my road, I guess you will, to, if you will, to becoming a physician, I knew that I was going to be a physician when I was six. Um, and as I progressed through my training and my education, at first I thought maybe I wanted to be a hematologist. I didn't know the word at that time, but I wanted to study disorders of the blood. Um, really what I was interested in was diabetes, and that's endocrine, but I didn't know that at the time. I thought it was a blood disorder, so there it is. <laughs> okay. <laughs> I didn't know. <laughs> um, as I progressed a little further, I thought maybe I wanted to be a pediatric oncologist. For people that don't know, that means kids dealing with kids who have cancer. Um, and then as I got a little further along, I thought maybe I wanted to be a psychiatrist. And then I went to medical school and did my psychiatry rotation. And I didn't like it very much. So, <laughs> And ultimately, you know, as, as, as others have mentioned today, you, you have to decide really fast in medical school in this country. By third year, you need to have a sense of where you're going with this. And I knew that family medicine was likely a good place for me. There was a few specialties that niggled at the back of my head, but I knew that family medicine was probably the right place for me. And I didn't really have a great deal of interest in being in the city, so I knew that rural family practice was probably going to be the right place for me. And then I really sat down and thought, okay, well, what is it that I know about being a doctor? Because that, I think, is going to define what I'm going to do with the rest of my life. What do I know about being a doctor? Well, what I know about being a doctor is what the doctors in Fort Nelson do, and that is deal with whatever walks, crawls, or is dragged into their clinic or their emergency department. What else are you going to do? There isn't anybody else to manage it. And that is exciting medicine to me. That is cool stuff. I go in one day, I deal with high blood pressure, I deal with diabetes, I deliver a baby, I look at x-rays, I sew people up, I manage fractures, I assist in the operating room, I get to do a really broad spectrum and every day is different, no day is the same, and it's really, really exciting for me. So that is amongst the reasons why I chose a place like High Level where I can do what I want to do. This is the kind of medicine that I want to practice. They're very supportive of my career goals. So I said when I went to High Level, I said, you know, I kind of want to progress my career. I don't want to just stop here. I want to keep going. I want to keep learning. Part of being a physician is learning every day. And I want to be able to develop some of the things that I'm passionate about. I love obstetrics. 
I love delivering babies. I love the whole process of pregnancy and labor, delivery, you name it. And I want to be able to carry on with that. And I really want to be able to do C-sections. And I said, so if I come there, will you guys support me in teaching me to do C-sections and in learning? And they said, yes, we will. Absolutely, no problem. Within a month, I was assisting already. And I had assisted a lot before. Um, but within a month, I was helping hold the tools in the assist. And the opportunity came up within, I was in high level for six months, January, June till December. And the opportunity came up in late November, early December for me to start my formal program in January. And they said, go. Six months investment they put into me and they're willing to send me for this training. And I love them for that. They believe, that they believe in me and I love them for that. The community is excited. The medical community is excited. I'm excited. And it's about lifestyle. I like to be outside. I like to hunt. I like to fish. I like to play. I like to travel. And I can do that. I can do all of that out of high level. Ultimately, it's about this little dude. It's about making sure that he can be my highest priority. And when he has siblings to join him, they get to be my priority too, and I can do that in high level. That's an, it's an amazing thing in a medical community to say that that's the way it can be for you as your family gets to be a priority. Other attractions to high level? I have colleagues that really love their work. And so when I went there, and again, I've said this and, and I will keep saying it again and again and again. When I went there, I saw that the doctors there were really happy. They really like what they do. They like where they are and they like what they do. And that makes high level really an attractive place for me. This is a picture of some of us having a good time in the operating room. Of course, we're all dressed in our various alien gear because you can't be in the OR unless you are. Um, on, the, on the far right, you see Dr. Mark Forder. He's our anesthetist. Um, laying on the table, preparing for, I, I suppose, a cesarean section is Stephen. He's our uh, manager, a nursing manager. Um, and the doctor who's all scrubbed up and ready for surgery is Paul Walsh. He is a, a longtime physician resident in, in high level. Um, and he's practicing primarily obstetrics now, and he's an amazing mentor and a great person to work with, so we like to have fun there. We have a really great relationship with nursing, and I think that that is something that, from a medical community perspective, can really, really be sold. Um, I've worked in places where there are adversarial relationships with nursing, and it just makes life so much more difficult than it ever needed to be. I honestly, we work with amazing nurses. Um, they're happy. They work a lot. They're happy. And it makes it easy for me to work there. This is some of our nurses doing their Ebola training. In case we ever get a case of Ebola in high level, we are going to be prepared, folks. I want to just focus on nursing for a minute. And nursing, by when I say nursing, I'm talking nurses themselves, but also other allied healthcare professionals. I love the work that RPAP does. I love the idea of physician recruitment, and I hope that I get a chance to be involved with this in the future. But I really would love to promote the idea as well of recruiting other healthcare professionals. Without nursing support, I'm going to have a really, really bad day every day. The, the, the people who are doing this work on an everyday basis, the nursing staff are my eyes, they're my ears, they're my sounding board, they're the people that I discuss problems with, and they're really amazing. And I want to just put a little bug in ears because I think that you guys are the STPs. You guys are the, the ones who can get stuff done. You're the mountain movers. So I want to put a little bug in your ears about nursing in addition to physicians. A rural nurse is a really, really valuable and special person. 
Many, many nurses are amazing, wonderful, beautiful people who love their work. They're, you know, they work in medical wards, they work in surgical wards, they work in the emergency department, and they're amazing, and they're specialized. A rural nurse is a pure generalist. In as much as I go from being an obstetrician to a psychiatrist to a surgeon to an emergency doc to a pediatrician all in one day, I'm doing all of these jobs. The nurses that are working with me are also doing all of these jobs. And without them to support me, I'm going to be in bad trouble in a real hurry. So for those of you who are mountain movers, I think that it would be great to get some more nursing recruitment going. And I think that if we could talk some of the paradigm makers into shifting their minds a little bit, a little known fact is that Nursing unions don't allow for nurses to be paid extra to work in rural areas. They also don't allow for a great deal of recruitment bonuses or other business like that. And I feel like that's unfair. Maybe that's because my mom is a nurse, my aunts are nurses. But these nurses, the ladies and gentlemen who do this work, are amazing people who have put a great deal into this and they have unbelievable skills well beyond not what a specialized nurse is capable of, because certainly she's capable of it, but the rural nurses are capable of it right now. You're it. Exactly. You're it, right? The same thing as the doc. You're it. And so, anyways, there you go. That's my, that's my perspective. I think that we should be recruiting others, too. We also, in high level, and I think that all of your communities are probably doing this, so again, this is back to me telling you stuff that you already know, okay? Um, there's a huge focus on our capabilities and our growth in high level, and that's amazing. We are not a uh, we-can't-do-this community. Our hospital administration is not we-can't-do-this people. Our community is not we-can't-do-this people. Our physicians are not we-can't-do-this. We're can-do people. We know that there's a lot of work involved and a lot of, you know, various miscellaneous involved, but that's okay. We're not scared of that. Nobody's ever been scared of hard work who's a rural practitioner. Um, and so we focus on what we can do. One of the really interesting things that we've done in out of high level is we've set up video conferencing facilities to a number of our outlying areas. Fox Lake, for example. Who knows where Fox Lake is? Oh my goodness, yay, there's lots of people who know. <laughs> Fox Lake is a small creek community that is north and uh, east of high level. It is not an easy place to get to. It is a fly-in location primarily. I'm told that sometimes in the winter there may or may not be an ice bridge there. Um, but I'll tell you what's really interesting is some days it's not a fly-in or fly-out community because the runway is too muddy and the plane can't land. Some days it's not a fly-in or fly-out community because the helicopter pilots are timed out. And on one such morning, I came in to work, and the girl stopped me in the emergency department and went, um, could you just not go to your clinic right now? And I said, okay, what's going on? Well, the girls in Fox Lake need your help. And we just need to set up the video conference stuff so that you can help them. I said, okay, what's going on? Well, they have a lady in labor, and the problem is um, the plane can't get in <laughs> or out because <laughs> the runway is too soft and muddy, and the helicopter pilots are timed out. So, yeah, she's been laboring there all night. Can you help them? And I went, sure, let's do it. So we got all set up on the video conference equipment, and I'm looking at this adorable little room with no patient. And so I said to the lovely lady who came on the video conference screen, I said, is it possible for you to move this equipment so that uh, I can see my patient? And she went, uh, no. <laughs> All right. Is it possible to move the patient? Uh, no. Okay. So tell me a little bit about this. And so I found out over the, you know, this is a nice normal pregnancy. This is a pre the ladies had a previous delivery before and everything's fine. It's a term pregnancy. And between them, the 
uh, EMS lady and the nurse practitioner who were in high level, or in rather Fox Lake at the moment, had between them six deliveries. Excellent. <laughs> I said, all right. Well, what do you do? <laughs> I said, okay. So when's the last time the patient was examined? Well, a little while ago. And, okay, so maybe we should examine her again and find out. Oh, we, we think that she's fully dilated and she's ready to push. But we're asking her not to do that. And I said, why are you asking her not to do that? Well, because we wanted to find out if you think that we should try to get the helicopter pilot awake and put her on the, air, on the helicopter. I said, no. <laughs> no, I'm afraid that if you do that, the net result will be that you will deliver a baby on the helicopter. I don't know how many of you have seen the back of a helicopter, but it's not adequate. You can't do that. <laughs> so I said, all right, well, you know what? Just, I mean, let her push. What are you going to do? Let her push, deliver the baby. So, okay, so they're going to let her push, and then they say, well, what, what after that? Okay, well, you clamp the cords. I mean, they've got the basics, right? And then what should we do? I said, nothing. Leave the placenta alone. Let it do its own thing. It'll deliver on its own. And they went, okay, if you're sure. I'm sure. And at the end of the day, it all went very smoothly. Everything went fine. Um, this little guy is now, I think, what, four months old, something like that. And it's amazing. Look at how amazing that is. To me, that is fantastic. It's not the ideal situation. I wouldn't promote doing it as a routine practice. <laughs> but the beautiful part about rural medicine is when the fit hits the shan, we don't worry about it a whole lot. We just get it done. And that's the beautiful part. You know, I've been in lots of places that are like that, where <laughs> you don't worry about what the obstacles are, you just get it done. We have really easy to reach consultants. And this is a, this is a shout out and a kudos to um, all the forward thinkers who put together Rapid North, um, the forward thinkers who have put together other consulting services who are prepared to take my phone call at any time of the day or night and get my butt and my patient's butt out of hot water. Um, it's one single call and that for, for physicians who have come from a place or who are coming from a place where it may be more complicated than that, that's a huge selling factor. One phone call gets me a consultant. That single phone call can also get me a plane ride out for my patient. So we have really, really good transport and for, in high level we use uh, aeromedical. STARS is an amazing service. I know this even from practicing in northern BC because, again, you remember how I said we thought we're, we think that we're Albertans? Well, it turns out in some, some respects we really are because the catchment area of northern Alberta and rapid north actually extends off into BC because it's easier to transport patients from that part of BC into Alberta than it is to get them into the southern parts of BC. So STARS is fantastic. And these guys are so good. You know, in my first month in high level, I had a young lady come in, 32 weeks pregnant, in labor. That's not long enough. I really don't want that baby to be born in high level if I can avoid it. At the end of the day, the baby was born in high level, but that wasn't because I wasn't getting transport fast enough. Inside of an hour, I had aeromedical on the ground in my emergency department ready to take that patient for me. Turns out she was eight centimeters dilated by then and nobody's gonna put her on a plane then and they shouldn't. But an hour, an hour. What, how do you even come up with that? I'm not sure that they can do that in Edmonton between the Royal Alex and the university. I'm not sure they can't either, but that's amazing. It's not always that fast and again, you know, sometimes we deal with adversity, but that's amazing. A small barrier that I want to address. A lot of my more urban friends hear some of my war stories and go, oh my god, aren't you terrified? Don't you work terrified all of the time? And I go, no. Sometimes I look back at a situation that I've dealt with and go, why were you not terrified? <laughs> What is wrong with you? <laughs> Why have you put yourself in this, in this situation? But at the end of the day, I'm not, I'm not terrified. And it's because I have really amazing colleagues to support me. And it's because of the personality that I have, OK? To me, this is exciting. I'm trained to do this. I trained rural. 
So this is the training aspect, okay? We need to continue to support this. And as in your communities, if you can welcome medical students and welcome residents, not just welcome them, but encourage them to come and have a look. Your doctors, your nurses, your staff all has to be really engaged in this because it doesn't work if people aren't engaged. The community needs to be engaged in this because what is really exciting and really amazing is, you know, when a, a medical student or a resident comes and they get to be first call when something is going on at the hospital. The call to the attending physician is directly after that call, but they get a phone call. Come and help us deliver this baby. Come and help us set a bone. Come and help us with you know this, that, trauma, whatever. Come help us. Come see what this looks like. Then they get the chance to be exposed to that kind of medicine and the idea that as a physician, you don't have to be a specialist in order to have a really exciting career and a really exciting life. I would argue that they have less exciting lives than we do, but who knows? I'm not a specialist, so I guess I don't know that. But this is, I think, really important. So if you, if you can invite these folks in while they're still in training, you're going to have a much higher chance of recruiting them when they're finished with their training. Terrified, right? <laughs> that's not how that was supposed to work but anyways so I mean I can tell war stories all day but that's not really what we're here about you can you know from the stories that I have told you can see this is exciting and you want people to be excited about this I want to shift gears from you know from the medical some of the medical you know what you can do as a as from a medical perspective um, and a medical community perspective to community perspective okay and I really want to emphasize this. It's not about the money. I think that the folks from Nanton, I was at your presentation uh, just a short while ago, and I really, really appreciate that you had a really good sense that it's not about the money. The reality of medical life is I can work anywhere. I can make money anywhere I go. It's not about the money. There are other attractive factors to a community. The kind of medicine that you get to do, the colleagues that you get to work with, the community that you get to live in. These things are amazing things, and it's not all about the money. That said, money can be a deterrent. Okay? And I would be, a, frankly, I would be lying to everybody if I did not admit that amongst the things that made me pick up stakes from Fort St. John and move to high level was financial considerations. At the end of the day, my overhead dropped by an astronomical figure. And what that means for me personally is I get to spend more time with my little guy because I can support my life with working a few less hours because my costs aren't so high. Some of the things that a lot of people don't know about graduating from medical school in Canada and graduating from residency in Canada, on average, medical students will graduate from medical school with $250,000 worth of debt. That is how much it costs them personally. That's before there's a house, that's before there's a car, that's before there's a vacation. $250,000. So debt management is huge. Um, and unfortunately, we kind of suck at it as doctors. Um, we have no, <laughs> I shouldn't say this about all doctors, okay? Everybody comes from a bit of a different perspective. But in general, people who have been decided that they're going to go into medicine have probably had a fairly one-track mind and they've been going into medicine for a long time, which means that they have not spent a lot of time developing other skills, like running a business. I came out of medical school knowing the square root of nothing about how to run a business, and I came out of residency knowing equally as much, and I still am not very good at it. I still have a lot of work to do to learn what is this business of medicine. I'm fortunate because I work in an AHS facility 
and an AHS clinic, so they look after a lot of the business end of it, but that may not be the situation for a lot of the communities. There may be um, solo practices or, or even group practices, but there's still going to be a business aspect to it, and doctors are often not business people. Where can that get us in trouble? Well, you know, when you're trying to run a business and a practice at the same time, those two things don't always go very well together. And it, it can create a great deal of stress. Housing is important, vehicles important. Essentially, we graduate with no idea. No idea what real life looks like, no idea what realities of practice look like, no idea of how we're going to manage our life in addition to our medical practice. See, like my son, he didn't know that he shouldn't be in the dishwasher. I'm just showing you pictures of my son because I think he's really cute. <laughs> so some ideas, some ways that I think might be useful, some things that I think might be really useful to be able to have on offer when you first bring a physician into your community, particularly if you're gonna look at recruiting somebody who has not run their own business before and who has not, you know, a new graduate from medical school or somebody who, you know, residents often locum around for a little bit, so they come to this community, that community, the next community. That's a really important person to show off your community to. If you're gonna have a locum, show off your community that locum. You might not get them that time, but they might come back, and they might come back again, and they might come back again. Show off your community. All of you are amazing advocates for your community. It's clear to me that you're all very proud of your communities and what you have on offer, show it off. I know you're good at it. Make sure you focus on the locums too because you might find somebody that's gonna come and stay. When they do come and stay, particularly if they haven't been in business before, if you can affect their work experience, and I don't know that you all can, okay? But if you can carefully control their work experience so that they're not terribly overwhelmed to begin with, that's really useful. When I started my medical practice in Fort St. John, it's a really overwhelming, it's a really overwhelming experience to go from being a resident to being a full service family doctor. Anybody ever watch Looney Tunes? <laughs> you know the pictures of Foghorn Leghorn or uh, Bugs Bunny where they're running around with the Easter basket and then they trip and the eggs go up in the air and they're trying to do this? That's how medical practice feels when you start. <laughs> so if you can control that a little bit, that would be really, that's really useful. If you can encourage people when they first come to your communities to schedule some administrative time. That's really useful to them. The hours and hours of paperwork that we do outside of our clinic hours, maybe it doesn't take other people hours. Maybe I'm still just learning, but they're gonna be in the same boat as me. They're gonna be just learning. So it's, it's, it's a significant investment of time outside of your clinic hours to get the referrals done, to get the chart notes finished, to get the results all entered and viewed and looked after so that you make sure that you're not missing, you know, Mrs. Henderson's blood sugar test happens to be up at 9.5. It takes a lot of time and it takes a lot of negotiation in your own life to learn how to manage checking your results, doing your rounds, making your referrals. So if you can encourage people to schedule some administrative time where they don't have to see patients, and they can just work on their administrative work, that's really, really useful, at least at the beginning of a practice. And encourage them to learn business skills. I know that each one of your communities has amazing business people in it who are really, really good at this. And whether they've learned by trial and error or whether they actually have training, these people can be a really great, really great resource for new physicians coming to your town because if we can get together with them and talk about what it looks like to run a business, then maybe we can come to a bit of a deeper understanding and be a little bit better at it so that we're not on the Freedom 85 plan. And a lot of doctors are on the Freedom 85 plan. <laughs> Financial planners, if you have those, those are good too. This is my baby learning that grandma's 
coffee table is really, really exciting because he can crawl in the middle of it. So the realities of moving from another country. Um, it's, it's expensive to move from another country. And, and that's okay. You know, people who are coming here are volunteering to come here. So again, it's not about the money, but there are things that can be a bit of a deterrent. And the more costs that you pile on, the easier it is to go, well, I'm just going to stay where I am. Um, Climate is a really big thing. It's a really big difference when you're coming from South Africa to come to high level. And in many instances, a lot of the folks who are coming really have no idea what kind of outerwear they need. They don't know what kind of vehicle they need. They don't know what kind of tires they need. So um, helping with some of that stuff might be useful. There's a cultural shift. Um, helping people stay in touch with their culture, I think, is really great. Being excited and learning about culture is really great. Helping with banking. It's not very easy when you come from another country. And I don't know this because I've had this experience. I have not. I'm Canadian born and raised. But I know this from talking to a few colleagues who have come from other countries. It's not even easy to get a bank account when you've come from another country. So helping to organize some of that kind of thing might be really useful as well when you've got somebody coming from another, uh, another country. The realities of, how, of real estate, I'm still not very good at real estate, but I know that when you're coming from another country, it can be even more confusing because real estate doesn't work the same way in one country as another. Schools for kids. Um, yeah, these are, these are things that can be a bit daunting when you're coming from another country, okay? Um, we've already talked about this. The cost, of, the cost of doing business, overhead costs can be overwhelming, daunting. As a new physician, you're so busy trying to keep the eggs from falling on the ground and splitting open that you really have no sense of what is the cost of doing business and is this reasonable cost? If I told you that my overhead had dropped by 75%, some of you might do some fast math and realize that I was paying a very great deal for the right to do business. Overhead is normal. We're all going to pay overhead. That's life. But understanding how some of this works and where some of the costs are coming from is pretty important. Um, and we're not always going to be good at that. The cost of travel, some of these remote communities are hard to get out of. Out of high level, it's going to cost me $1,000 to have a round trip to Edmonton on a plane. I know that some of your communities are the same. I'm not suggesting that the community has to pay for these sorts of things. I'm just saying that these are things that can be a bit of a deterrent. And if you can work out, think about brainstorm ways to manage some of these things so that they're a bit easier on newcomers to your communities, that might be a really significant point of attraction. The cost of continuing medical education. We have a great CME program in this country. We are all expected to maintain our, our familiarity with new concepts in medicine, new medications, new ways of doing things. And we do that by continuing medical education. Conferences cost a lot of money. The conference is more expensive when it costs you $1,000 to fly there. And that's to Edmonton from my community. Other places are going to be a little easier to get to and from, OK? This may not be a concern for every community, but these are just some of the special concerns that I have noted coming out of northern BC and also out of northern Alberta. And I suspect that there are places all over Alberta, both central and south, that are equally remote that may be a little bit challenging to get out of to get to CME. And again, I, I don't have all of the great big answers. I'm just saying you guys are the STPs that can figure out how to get around this kind of stuff. So these are some of the concerns that physicians might have coming to your communities. So what, for me, and for others might make a really attractive community. You guys tell me. You're better at this than I am. Nanton has done an amazing job. Um, and I think probably, again, I'm telling you guys a bunch of stuff that you already know. 
Um, you know, obviously you guys are here to showcase your communities and when your, you know, new recruits come, showcase your community and tell the visiting doctors who are there and tell the locums who are there. If you're a kind of community where you have visiting specialists, so on high level, we have visiting specialists, Dr. Brian Muir, ob comes to visit us once a month. Uh, Dr. Wessels, who is an orthopedic surgeon, comes to visit us once a month. We have a pediatrician who comes once every six weeks. We have a pediatric cardiologist that comes a couple of times a year. So if you tell all of these folks too, then they're working, you know, they're coming to your community from bigger centers and they're working with residents and they're working with medical students. And if the residents and the medical students get brave and tell them that they're interested in rural medicine and they really love coming to your community because your community is an amazing place to come and do consulting for them, then they're gonna tell the medical students and the residents that your community is a really amazing place and maybe they ought to come and have a look. That can be a huge driver in terms of um, setting up locums, setting up rotations, whatever like that, that might get more and more people, get your community more and more exposure. Um, some personal uh, things from a personal experience. It's really so helpful if you, I think a community navigator person would be a really, really interesting thought for uh, incoming physicians. So these are the little things. These are, you know, a lot of the stuff that I've talked about is the little stuff. And that's why my presentation is called It's the Little Things. So the little things. A community navigator or a point person to talk to. What about getting a house? What kind of car do I need? I'm from the north, so I know what kind of a vehicle I need in the north. I know what kind of weather to expect in the north. But some people are not from the north. If we were to suspend reality for a second and say that I decide that I'm going to pull up stakes and move to Brooks, I know the square root of nothing about living in southern Alberta. And it would be really useful to have somebody that can tell me what does this look like to live in southern Alberta. Where do you even get car insurance? I came from BC. In BC, insurance, car insurance and house insurance is pretty well a centralized effort. It's ICBC. Where do you get car insurance in BC? ICBC, that's it. Where do I get car insurance in Alberta? I don't know. <laughs> Where do you even get this stuff? So that's important information to have, and it seems like really trivial, but when you don't know, and you're busy trying to run your medical practice, like, oh, right, I have to get my car insured somewhere. I wonder where I'm going to do that. Where can I get my vehicle inspected? If you're coming from another province, you have to have an inspection on your vehicle before it can be registered and insured. And registration of your vehicle, for that matter. This is a complete, again, this, Alberta is a really unique situation, at least from my experience in BC. This happens all in one spot. In Alberta, you got to jump through three different hoops and go to five different organizations to figure this stuff out. I'm exaggerating, of course, but you see, you see this is the little stuff that I didn't know. Um, what banks are there? It is a real true pain in the neck to have all of your banking done at a bank where there is not a branch in your town. So being able to get a bank account set up, get, your, get things transferred over so that you can deal with somebody that's local, way better. What kind of survival needs do you have in, these, in this community? So in high level, I mean, I can tell you all about high survival in the north because I've been in the north my entire life. The south, it's going to look different. The central, it's going to look different. In high level, you need a block heater. People from southern Alberta probably don't have block heaters in their cars. You do? Oh, good. In, see, in southern BC, they don't. If you buy a vehicle in Vancouver, I can just about promise you it doesn't have a block heater. And on the first day that it goes to minus 35 and high level when you don't have a block heater, you know how well that's going to go. They're going to be going, oh, fantastic. <laughs> right? <laughs> you need a coat. You need some boots. You need a snow shovel. You might need a, a you know, you might need a, a, a snow blower. You might... Who knows? What are the survival needs? What are things that you as a community member who's been there for 5, 10, 15, 25, 55 years, things that you take for granted that you just have? And you would never think to tell somebody, you should probably have this. Those are in, that's useful information right there. 
What kind of community events are there? I know that every community is making all the efforts in the world to try to make this really visible and really public, and sometimes it's still not, because these are people who are doing their best to be website designers while they're also trying to be the mayor or town council or whatever else like that, and sometimes it's not always very easy to find out what's going on. For somebody who's lived in that town and community for a long time, it's very easy to find out what's going on. They ask down at the coffee shop or, you know, whatever like that. But you, when you don't have those, communicate, that, those connections yet, when you have not built those connections yet in the community, it's really nice to have somebody to tell you what's going on so that you can go to some of these events. Because most of the time, if you're going to come to a small community, at least for me, I don't want to just hide at my house. I want to be involved. This is my community now. This is my home. And I want to be able to be involved. What kind of schools are available? We've already talked about that one. Yard care. How many people like to do yard work? I do too. But guess how much time I don't have? <laughs> and my husband is busy looking after our baby. And when we moved to high level, our baby was only five months old. Not very easy to do yard care when you have a five-month-old to manage and when mommy's at work all day and into the night sometimes. Which is fine, I'm not complaining. I actually love my job or else I wouldn't do it. <laughs> okay, But yard care, you know, some people don't want to do their own yard care. Is there people that can do yard care for you? How do you even get a hold of these people? General contractors. I have two Great Danes. I bought a house that didn't have a fence. I had, to buy, I had to find somebody to build me a fence. I was very lucky because I have a really wonderful real estate agent who I peppered with questions. But if there would be a community navigator to help some of your new recruits, that might be really useful for them. That's, it's, a, it's an idea to make it really, really easy to move to your community. Really easy. Pet food. My Great Danes eat special food. Where do I even get that? These are things that, again, like I take this totally for granted now, but when you're first moving to a place, you've got to find somebody to answer these questions for you. Help with moving. So I was, you know, when I moved to high level, I tried to hire movers. It was a sheer disaster, and I fired them before we ever got started, and by that time, I was well behind the eight ball, and I didn't have time to hire another moving community, uh, another moving company. My husband has a really bad back. My dad, who's the other person that I would normally rely on, was having really bad problems with his hands. Neither one of them could do any of the heavy lifting. And so once again, I prevailed upon my real estate agent to go, who can I hire? Who does this in town? And that's, again, that's really useful information. I have no problem at all with paying for this kind of thing, and I don't think that any reasonable person would. I'm not suggesting that you should have a volunteer party to move the new recruits into their houses or whatever, although that might be really nice for them, but to have the information of how do you get your stuff into your house. I bought a house full of new furniture because my adorable Great Danes destroyed most of my furniture, so I let most of it go and bought some new stuff and it came in in trickles from the Sears outlet, and there's no Sears delivery in high level. So I had to try to organize a way to move all of that stuff myself. And I very foolishly felt that it was probably going to be reasonable for me to move my brand new wash machine and dryer into my house with my husband, who has a bad back. Turns out I was wrong. <laughs> <laughs> I tried to lift that thing and I was like, well, this is not going to go well. And so my choices were either find somebody to help or else do laundry in my garage. One of the two. So, you know, I call up Susie Clausen, who happens to be a nursing manager, and said, hey, Susie, do you know anybody that can help us do this? And that's amazing. To have that kind of a person that you can pepper with questions makes it a really, really easy transition to life and living in one of your amazing, fantastic communities. So some thoughts for you about retention. The first thing is you want to recruit the right doctor. And I think, again, the community of Nanton has done a really, really good job of that and has some really good thoughts on how do you recruit the right doctor. 
If you have a doctor who wants to practice obstetrics and basic, um, you know, bone setting and basic general surgery, whatever like that as a GP, and that sort of thing is probably going to come back, at least I hope it's going to come back into some of our more rural communities, that person is going to need an operating room and anesthetist and nurses that can manage an operating room and nurses who can manage a post-operative patient. So if that's the kind of doctor that is coming to visit your community and you don't have those things, that might not be the right physician for your community. You need to recruit the right doc. You want to recruit to what you guys have and where you want to go in your community. What kinds of things do you think are reasonable to keep going with? So in my career, I've had the privilege to locum in a wonderful little place in BC called Chetwind, where I partially grew up and where my grandparents have lived the bulk of their lives. And I love Chetwind. It is the sweetest, cutest little community. It's interesting medicine, First Nations medicine, cute little emergency room, everything like that. And they phoned me up one day and they said, Doc, what's it going to take to get you to move to Chetwind? And I said, honestly, because I don't believe in being dishonest with people, I said, if you can get me an operating room, an anesthetist, nurses to manage the whole business, I'll go out and learn how to do C-sections and we can start delivering babies in Chetwind again, I'll be right there. They just can't do it. It's just not feasible for their community right at the moment. So I'm not the right doctor for that community because I'm never going to be a happy person if I can't deliver babies. So recruit the right doctor and you're going to be in good shape. Know what kind of practice they want to do. Recruit their family. And I heard this so many times, you guys, you already know this. You already know this. I'm only telling you stuff that you already know. If the family's not happy, nobody else is going to be happy, right? It's the old adage that says, what is it, happy wife, happy life? Or if mama ain't happy, ain't nobody happy? <laughs> These things are truth. And I have seen people, not just in the realm of medicine, but from many other realms, who will say, if, if you can't move the family in, you can't have me either. I've seen people move away because spouses are not happy. Look at different business models. So one of the things that we do in high level is we've got full, five full-time equivalent docs. Two of those positions are cared for by four doctors. Six weeks in, six weeks out, going back and forth to South Africa. When they come to us, they work. That's it. They don't have, to, they don't have a family that they want to look after. They don't have other things to do. They work. That's it. And they love it. They're happy. They want to be there with us. It's an interesting business model. It's an interesting way to think about it. A full-time doctor, yes, that's the holy grail. A full-time, all the time, full-time, every single day doctor. But we're going to go on holidays. We're going to have breaks. I'm probably going to need a locum at some point because I'm going to have more babies, right? So it's thinking outside of the box in ways to get the services that your town needs might be a really, really useful thing. Um, some particularly uh, female docs who want to be at home with their small babies often share, share positions. So if you can recruit two at the same time, you know, two who both say, listen, I don't want to do this all the time, but, you know, I'd, I'd be happy enough to work half time and you can recruit two to work one position. That's fantastic. That's amazing. And I know that you guys are the forward thinkers who can work through these problems. Facilitate the community involvement again. We don't always know what's going on in the community, particularly when we spend so much time in the emergency department, things like that. Um, but we do want to be involved. And this, never doubt that a small group of thoughtful, committed citizens can change the world. Indeed, it's the only thing that ever has. And this is you guys doing it. So again, thank you for listening to me drone on. Thank you for inviting me, and thank you for the work that you do every day. You guys are the change. <laughs>